for the Cubs Weekly Podcast presented by Wintrust, proud legacy partner of the Chicago Cubs and exclusive home of Cubs checking. Open online today at Wintrust.com slash Cubs Weekly. As always, Elise Menneker here, your host, Tony Andraki, Cubs reporter and player development analyst, Lance Brozdowski. Guys, first series in the book against the Brewers NL Central uh, opponent nonetheless. So we're just going to dive right in. Tony, your takeaways from a couple of wins in this series. Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway, to be honest, was just how good they looked overall. I mean, (laughs) you know, you're going up against the reigning Cy Young winner and Corbin Burns, then obviously Brandon Woodruff and Freddie Peralta. I mean, I know these guys go back to back to back in the Brewers rotation, but it's not often that a team has to face those three in the first three games of a series or of a season. And I thought the Cubs just looked amazing, you know, in terms of just those three guys in particular, the lineup had so much uh, length, I think, and, and consistency. And it looked like it had that diversity that Jed Hoyer and Theo Epstein have been talking about for a while. The, the guy, the contact guys mixed with some power and just taking advantage of opportunities. I mean, against Brandon Woodruff on Saturday, they scored three runs before they even got a hit. So it, it really, I, I think it just stood out to me how their approach, they, didn't, they weren't chasing, they weren't swinging and missing a lot. And, and to me, that was the biggest takeaway is, because I know it's three games and I know it's an incredibly small sample size, but if that approach is able to stick around for a longer period of time, it's going to be a much different offense than we've seen from the Cubs over the last few years that did fall into a little bit more of boomer bust. And I think it's something that is a bit more sustainable because it's not only that this happened, but this is what the Cubs have been saying they wanted to have happen from their lineup for a long time. And when you add pieces like Madrigal or Seiya Suzuki into the mix, Now we're seeing that a little bit. So I thought that was my biggest takeaway is they just went out on the field and showed exactly what they've been trying to do. Won't always be that easy, but they were able to do it against three Cy Young caliber pitchers. Lance, what about you? I'm going to take the low hanging fruit and go say a Suzuki. I mean, the guy looks incredible. (laughs) Uh, I I was blown away by the approach. I think is the key thing that stands out in terms of his ability to already understand the strike zone. Even if he hasn't seen any of the pitchers like Burns and Woodruff, or any guys that are even comparable to those guys over in Japan in terms of the velocity and the movement on those pitches. But it jumps out to me. I mean, I'll go as far as to say he seems like an easy all-star bet right now if you really want to try to get ahead of ourselves, where if he stays healthy and this continues, like he seems to be in that high 380s, 400 OVP. Like he had 38-ish or however many home runs in Japan, but I, I don't even think with as polished of an approach as he has at the plate that you need that much power to be a very, very plus offensive player for me it's like run into 20 25 home runs take the Peralta slider that kind of hangs up and hit it out every now and then but just get on base like I I think that's an incredibly underrated part of some players games that maybe goes a little bit by the wayside as we've gotten into like the three true outcome approach where it's high K and high homer but I I think he's a guy that could be low K high walk high homer or even average homer and that's like a four to five war player I'm, I'm blown away by him yeah I think it was super impressive to see Suzuki get a hit in each game of the series, including his first home run, uh, to see his plate approach more than anything, uh, willing to take his walks, which is part of his game, of course, but just how he's been able to execute that and not really give in even at this level. And I'm with you, Tony, where I think just the the lineup and how balanced it seems, the way that they're producing, feeding off each other. And I think to go along with that, just kind of the fun they're having. There's a very looseness and like youthfulness to this team. Just a lot of guys who are happy to be out there. I think for sure, Seiya is one of those guys too. He just is, is so enjoying himself. Um, and you just get this fun vibe from all the players uh, and just kind of the new energy now that is a part of this team with a lot of the new faces as their identity will start to take shape over this season, but just kind of what that looks like. It was really fun in that first series against one of the tougher opponents they'll probably face, not just uh, in the central, but also just in baseball. So I think that was a fun part of it too. It was um, a real sense of while early, uh, okay, here's how they're doing against some of the best pitchers in baseball. And so far it was a a fun first look at a lot of their potential. Um, So as much as um, in some ways, I guess you could say, I don't know if the lineup was surprising given the pieces and the potential there, but Lance um, just maybe what did surprise you in those first few games? Well, I was going to see Horner hit a home run. I I, I think I always (laughs) rag rag him all the time in the office because he hasn't hit a home run so long. Like the contact skills are so good with him, but he just doesn't barrel a lot of balls. So to see that very early in the season for me was a great plus. 
Like I think that anytime you get some of those barrels up front, barrel being ideal combination of exit velocity and launch angle, which produces some of the most uh, beneficial results as a hitter, to see that early on was huge in my opinion. But even guys like Hap, seems like some of the stuff that he adjusted in the final two months of last year um, are going to stick. Um, I, I, those two guys in particular, I even think like a Suzuki could jump up to the second spot in the lineup with those OVP skills. So I, I guess in my opinion, it's more a matter of like some of those guys that maybe were interspersed through the lineup rising to get more player appearances and potentially being up in higher leverage spots. That's a, that's a key for me. Yeah. I, I think for me, um, you know, Suzuki definitely was a little bit of a surprise, but I think just overall, I was surprised by how the Brewers played. I wasn't expecting that level from them. I mean, they made some errors. There were some, there were some plays that were maybe even, you know, borderline or controversial calls that were hit or error um, that ended up going even in the way of hits for the Cubs. But, you know, I just, I, you know, this is a team that won the division last year has won over 90 games for a few years in a row. Like we talked about, you know, the three Cy Young starting pitchers out there and, and they made some mistakes. They were walking guys, they were hitting guys. Um, they were making mistakes in the field, you know, some base running mistakes in there. And the Cubs took advantage of all of that. And I think that was, you know, a pleasant surprise in the Cubs end because this is a team that when they were at their best, even a few years ago, they were taking advantage of mistakes. And we saw during their hot stretch in May of 2021 last year, they were also taking advantage of the opponent's mistakes a lot. And so I think that's just a big key in baseball. It's not something that is tangible that you can always necessarily work on, but the Cubs were able to maximize that. And I think that was a, a nice surprise overall that one, the Brewers made that many mistakes, but two, the Cubs were able to capitalize on all of them throughout this opening series. Yeah, I, I think you make a really good point because I was thinking about it too from the Cubs perspective. But as I was watching the series, I was actually surprised too. I was I was trying to figure it out and just kind of reminding myself that it's so early in, in the season, obviously, that man, you know, you think these guys will come out really sharp and just be who they are. But um, yeah, it's just kind of that reminder. There's a long way to go because you'd have to think um, – what we saw out of the Brewers in the, this first series is not what we would see consistently out of them. Um, so, yeah, I think that um, with you too, Lance, uh, and the Nico Horner stuff, right? Yeah. I think you're all saying, like, if you had it on your bingo card that Nico Horner would have the first home run of the major league season, you win. You're right. Yep. Um, and I think just for surprises in the first three games, I feel like, um, I feel like you guys kind of just – like summarized it. Cause I was trying to think as, as you were talking and if I had anything else to add, and I feel like I had something off the top of my head right now, I lost it. How about, how about the homegrown pitching for the shutout? I think that's another okay. thing. Maybe. Yeah. We saw some of these guys in triple a last year. I imagine at least I believe. Yes. Right? Um, so I didn't see, like, I can't even remember. Let me go through now. Some of the guys who are in, cause now off the top of my head, Thompson, of course, I even saw mm -hmm. in steel in, in triple a who we yep. know, uh, steel got the start. You know what? I think even that's who I was thinking too, where I thought steel was really impressive. I like steel and Thompson back to back as well. Um, because I think obviously that's a focus this year for the Cubs and what all of us will be looking at is how this rotation kind of shapes out and pitching in general, um, just with how we're entering this season. But I think that was really exciting. Promising, promising too, especially with Hendricks setting the tone. Hendricks was no surprise. That's not the surprise element there. Um, but yeah, I think that's a good point. Just all the arms, even that we'll see too coming out of the bullpen and how that could shape out. So fun stuff uh, that we have there. And I actually, as we go into who, someone who impressed us, you called it the low hanging fruit, Lance. I'm, I'm going to say, I'm not going to overthink this one because I think I just have to go with say a Suzuki. Um, I mean, I think it's really easy to think that he would need more time. We saw him come mm -hmm. along in spring training, no doubt about it. But I think uh, again, some of the best pitching again, that we saw uh, in the league to see the way that he took his at bats. And I think what's impressed me the most about him is despite the fact that he even said, I haven't even seen some of the pitches that mm -hmm. I'm seeing come at me in Japan. He's still able to keep his plan in the box and not bite at any of these pitches that are even close. Um, so that I thought was really impressive. And I know he was most impressed, or at least he uh, really liked that. He took a couple of walks there uh, in that first game. I think it was. So um, I, that's, yeah, I think he's fun and impressive. What about you, Tony? Yeah, for sure. I mean, and the only strikeouts he had were looking because 
I mean, I think he swung and missed once, maybe total in the first three games, or maybe not even at all. But, you know, he just wasn't chasing outside the zone. So certainly impressive. All the points you guys have brought up. I mean, all weekend I was impressed by Seiya, his approach, how he's able to be calm coming over, you know, and only having less than 20 plate appearances in spring in games before coming in and facing Burns and Woodruff and Peralta and all of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, To me, you know, what stood out or what impressed me the most is what you touched on a little bit at least is Justin Steele. I mean, Kyle Hendricks is huge and the Cubs need him at the beginning of the rotation, but it's also not necessarily a surprise because we've seen that before, especially in 2020. And, and, you know, even before that Steele to me could be an absolute game changer for this rotation. And he now has not given up a run in his last two starts dating back to last year, 12 innings, no runs, 12 strikeouts. I mean, he's able to get swing and misses. He's able to pitch through a bunch of righties in a row, you know, from the left side, he has some swing and miss stuff. He's working on different pitches. He even was talking at the end of spring training about how he's, he's getting to the point where he is, feels comfortable. He wants to start doing some different uh, mechanics and, and stuff like that, like Stroman is where he has like a hitch in his delivery. So, I mean, when a guy's talking like that, and this is only like his fourth start here of what would be normally like spring training, but he's doing it against a playoff type lineup in Milwaukee. I just thought that was impressive. I mean, he's, He's a guy that, like, we talk about homegrown pitching and everything else. Like, if this guy can can continue to ascend and be this young, you know, hard-throwing guy from the left side in this rotation, it really – it just would go so far for this rotation when you have Hendricks and Stroman and however else it plays out with Smiley and so on. So, Steele impressed me the most, and, and he's a guy that I'm definitely going to be watching as the season goes on. Lance, how about you? Me? Okay, I'm going to go Hendricks. I know you said that it's not particularly surprising. Should I ask There's a lot of anticipation else on the around that. I wasn't sure. <laughs> you got to keep everybody, you know, right on the edge of the Maybe it's my job as the host, right? I'm try- I got to keep you engaged. You got to keep this flowing, right? Okay, totally my bad. Fine, totally That's fine. Ronnie, I'll go. I'm going to go Kyle Hendricks. You mentioned that it wasn't surprising he pitched well, but his last year was not particularly great. I think it's okay to say that if you look at some of the uh, the underlying metrics and everything. But the curious thing for me about last year was that it was really hard to drill into why he was bad. It wasn't really a command thing. We have some cool data from Inside Edge now to look at if a guy's actually hitting their target and whether that changes and fluctuates. And it didn't really look too different for him from 2019 to 2020 to 2021. The results were just bad. And, and, and we noticed that in starts. And for him to come out and pitch how he did, super he- heavily relying on the changeup, but in the two kinds of changeups he throws too, especially depending on the hand he's facing. But I was really impressed with that. Like, I, I think that there was a good probability that he just bounced back in that last year. Maybe it was a little more of a blip than we thought. And I don't think projections were too kind to him. And looking at his season before this start and afterwards now, I, I'm a little bit more confident saying that maybe 2019-ish is more of what we're going to see than 2021. You know, so I always get worried with guys who are a little bit older and maybe they fall off. And when they fall off, it's, it's usually not as linear. It's not like they're stepping down ever so slightly every year. It's usually like a what happened, you know? And I was worried we were running into that last year. And I just don't think we're there yet. So hopefully it's another good year of Hendricks. Yeah, I, I feel like especially, I mean, I don't want to speak for Hendricks, but he's someone who's been so consistent. To me, he always just has that mindset where it's almost like he just wouldn't even allow some, does that make sense? Yeah, no, I totally he's so agree. always locked in that he will, he will look back and say, that wasn't me. I'm not going to let that happen. That's just like the competitor mm-hmm. he is. So yeah. Uh, if I remember the stat, right. That that's the first time, like in his career, like even talking college that he has had an ERA over four or maybe since like sophomore year of college, something crazy, crazy like that. Um, I was doing that off the top of my head. So I may not have it exactly right, but it's something along those lines, just to give you an idea of how uh, it is such a rarity, what we saw um, even just in the, the final stretch for Hendricks, because early on had some good starts. Um, when we look at then like storylines or trends, things we want to pay attention to over the next few weeks, uh, curious Tony or Lance, we'll start with you. Cause Tony, I just did last time. So Lance, Mm-hmm. going to you <laughs> um storyline anything that uh you're thinking about moving forward yeah i want to see how some of this outfield depth shapes shapes out I, I think we've seen like a mix of playing time and a mix of at bats and i, I think to get a, a representative sample of how frazier and ortega and hayward in particular and other guys look we're going to need a little bit more time so i think that's the narrative over the next like two weeks as they go to pittsburgh colorado and then back home to, to face tampa bay um, I think the Tampa Bay series is going to be really interesting. They're a fun team to watch, even though I don't think anyone will know any player on their team just because they're <laughs> a bunch of random players. But uh, 
but yeah, I, I think that that for me is the key is just how do the outfielders look, particularly on the offensive side of the ball? Like how does Ortega look? Uh, Frazier, I thought, had some pretty good hard hit balls. I think that's going to be pretty predictive. But um, the mix of the outfielders is big. We have David Brennan Davis looming in AAA as well. And it's like something's got to drop at some point, right? You can't carry six outfielders for long, especially if they, uh, as the, as the, at the end of the month, as the roster contracts by two spots. I, I'm very curious to see how it shakes out and what the bench looks like. Yeah, you know, I, I'm with you, Lance. I do think that's really fascinating and that, you know, I, like you said, at the end of April, a roster going from 28 to 22, or sorry, 26 is certainly going to be interesting. For me, it's lineup construction, and it's something you touched on, Lance, a little bit ago, too. Just, I, I think it's fascinating how Ross is going to slot these guys in, because with Seiya's on-base skills that we've touched on already, I could see him being in the two-hole, and especially when you talk about, like, protection and how that factors in. You know, we saw Frank Schwindel have a lot of success in the two hole last year because he had Ian Happ, who was red hot right behind him, Wilson Contreras and Patrick Wisdom right after that. So, yeah, you know how this all plays out, you know, where guys are hitting like Patrick Wisdom has been hitting eighth for the first couple games. I know it's against tough righties that he doesn't necessarily match up great against. But, you know, this is a guy who set the Cubs rookie home run record. Like, where does he slot in? You know, Nico, uh, we know his contact ability, but he also has incredible numbers with runners in scoring position, even with two outs. So like, does he hit higher up than ninth? So I know it doesn't necessarily matter overall in the grand scheme of things, but I do think it'll be really interesting just to see how this plays out. If a guy like Suzuki will ascend, you know, how Schwindel bats in there. And really just, if, if you look at it overall, the length of this lineup seems like it's going to be a strength from day to day here because of depth, you know, injuries obviously withstanding, but you know, a guy like Magical can hit wherever, Happ and Contreras as well. So that's something that I think um, will play for me as well. And, and then also against lefties, you know, Ortega is not going to be in there, you'd figure, against lefties. But against right-handed pitchers, like, he looks great he, as, in the leadoff spot, just like he did at the end of last year. So that's what I'm going to be keeping an eye on most, I think, is how Ross slots those guys one through nine with the DH here too. Yeah, I think uh, those are good points and kind of like uh, what I'm – going to say is around along the same lines. Uh, so one to go off of that with the depth component, like how injuries are going to play a part, because I think that's just something that we'll be monitoring all season. And I think that's going to be a real big thing as we, you know, get deep into this season, just the health for the teams. And I even thought of it because when Hap, obviously something um, out of his control, but getting hit by the pitch, for instance, and just now wanting to take it slow to make sure that he's healthy. Um, just as we monitor basically all of these guys, I know that he came in to spring training with the elbow um, and things like that, but uh, just how that could play a role at this, even at the start of this season. Um, and I think too, uh, like keeping an eye on the depth, I was, uh, I really enjoyed watching all the depth and, and how the pieces came together in just a few games. Uh, so to your point, Lance, like with the outfield, um, it was actually fun though, to see, cause in the situation say where then you want to take it easy on half after he gets hit, it's like, Oh, okay. I think Frazier, right. He just went in right yeah. form ran. And so it's like, boom, no drop off, you know, just keep moving on. So it was kind of fun to see like the pieces and how they could work in different situations. So, um, for me, yeah, I think it's, it's kind of just along those same lines and just, um, in different ways, like other things, to kind of keep an eye out for that. I feel like all of us are, are kind of watching to begin with even. Um, so then as we look ahead, what will be the key for the Cubs to carry this early season success into the rest of the month? So Tony, uh, what would you say is the key for that? I think it comes down to the bullpen. Uh, you know, we talked just the lineup obviously did well, the rotation certainly outpitched the Brewers top three, but it, the bullpen, I think, left a little something to be desired um, just over the course of the first few games. But, you know, obviously they're still so fresh into this. I mean, Michael Givens has made two appearances in the regular season. He made one in Cactus League play, you know, but he's looked really good. He's he's pumping 95 on the radar gun. David Robertson has looked really good. You know, Ethan Roberts, I think, had like 21 inches of, of vertical or of horizontal movement on his slider when he made his debut. Like, you know, seeing how these guys play out, how Ross, you know, kind of continues to work with Hadavi and, and Chris Young and the rest of the pitching infrastructure to slot these guys in there, um, I think is going to be the biggest key because – I do think this rotation can can be, you know, can 
maybe not necessarily have like a one one seven ERA for the rest of the month, but like can continue to have success along these lines. Same with the offense and being opportunistic. But I think the bullpen is certainly going to be just a big part of of this team. And and if they're going to have success, if they're going to kind of surprise some people and get on that playoff contention radar when April turns into May, it, it'll come down to the bullpen. It'll come down to where guys slot in certain roles, maybe who steps up in the ninth inning or in the seventh, eighth, ninth roles, uh, and, and who Ross can turn to and trust in that spot. That's what I'm going to be looking for. Yeah. And, I, and I'll, I'll go on the, like the OBP side of things, I guess, generally, I think that that's something that's been touched on a ton, but just that approach, I, I don't necessarily think this lineup is one that's going to end up with like a ton of home runs towards the top of the league or like, ton of power per se but that doesn't mean they can't be a productive offense I just think that productive offense is going to have to come from approach side and hopefully a little bit of the say Suzuki rubbing off on other guys like the Horner approach the Madrigal approach like the ability to just get on base and create runs that way and it, although that might create like a, a lower ceiling on the team I think it raises the floor a lot where they'll be able to stay in games but but Tony's point about the the bullpen is huge too I think I think the problem with like any team constructing a bullpen is like the better relievers often get pushed to that leverage spot such that when you're down like five, two in a game where it's still attainable and you still have a decent chance to win bringing in like those middle guys in the sixth inning, like those guys have become very important for keeping your win probability within a, an attainable part where a homer or two could put you back within a run. And then hopefully you have another two innings to get on top of a guy, but like the Jesse Chavez, the Daniel Norris of the world, like that, those are guys that you have to step up to keep them in games that, maybe look lost to at least have some kind of chance. Um, I'm not sure if you have any, any thoughts, at least anything jump out for you. I think for both of those factors, it's almost like, so you get a series win against the brewers, right? So you want to, you're thinking like, well, there's some success there against a good team. So it would be, let's, let's continue that recipe moving mm -hmm. forward. And in part, I think that recipe was the contact bats, um, not trying to do too much at the plate. And I think that's actually, um, what's going to make this team successful moving forward is um, yes, it's the makeup of these hitters at the plate. Um, but there seems to be a looseness to them. And I, it stuck out to me what Saya said um, after, I think it was his first game. Um, I'm, I was just able to be myself at the plate. And whenever a player says that it, it's always interesting to me because that's the whole point of what David Ross is always talking about. He says, my number one thing as a manager is I want all these players to just be themselves, whatever that means. And so when you hear players just saying that kind of on their own, you start to see things kind of at play here and working. And I think in part, then what we were seeing is because guys are hitting and because they're making not just contact, but Hey, in Horner's case, you know, hitting home runs or whatever it may be. Um, it takes pressure off the pitching. I don't think anyone in the Cubs rotation would ever say that how the Cubs are doing at the plate is going to affect them on the mound. But the truth is you can pitch looser. You can play better when you have a lead or when you know that your team can go to the plate and do some damage. And you're not just trying to carry it sometimes yourself, which it can be the, the game you're playing with yourself on the mound mentally, maybe not physically, but you're trying to remind yourself to stay in the moment. So, yeah, I think what we saw this weekend um, was fun. And, I, you know, it's like there's nothing really want to change. Now you just want to see the consistency, which is the whole point of this game, being able to kind of repeat those results and do it over and over again. So I'm with you guys. I think there was um, a lot of, of good things that we saw, even in the first few games, that would be exciting um, just to see that day in and day out. So on that note, we've talked about this Cubs team, what we saw in the first few games. Uh, and we also, of course, when we have Lance here, we're going to talk about some prospects. So after this commercial break, Lance has ranked the Cubs top prospects. We're going to kind of go through his list and grill him on his choices. So we'll don't do go it. anywhere. We'll be back after this. At Wintrust, we know true fans show their team pride every chance they get. With Cubs checking, you'll score a Cubs debit card so you can show your support every time you pay. Open today at Wintrust.com slash Cubs Weekly. $100 required to open. Member FDIC. Back here on the Cubs Weekly Podcast to talk about now the Cubs top prospects. And Lance, that is where we turn to you because you've actually put together your list. It's something you did last year. I imagine you would even maybe tweak it. I don't want to assume anything, but it's something I know you monitor at least throughout the yeah. entire season and how guys go up and down. So first, just give me a sense of going through this process again of the start of the season. Yeah, I feel like this one is almost setting up my next one to some extent because 
I have a little bit of a look inside under the behind the curtain, I think is the phrase with some of the data, especially on the minor league sides that I, that does drive a lot of my decision making processes around these. But we had a full year of data in 2021. And now I'm really interested to see the first two months of 2022. And then do a midseason update and really grill into some of these substantial objective changes that these guys made, whether it be on how much harder they're hitting the ball, if they change different shapes, if they have a higher velocity. And I think that gets back to a really good point around like, I think every player development system within an organization is trying to figure out what their edge is. And I, I imagine every team is asking themselves this question. And I imagine the teams are not telling you what it is. So you have to kind of make inferences off it. And the more I've been around individuals in the organization, my guess right now is that it's based off high performance. I think they have a really, really sound system starting prior to 2020 when they brought in Adam Beard and now with Corey Kennedy. He was he used to work with Olympic athletes in Canada. They've brought in a system where they can objectively measure things, understand if the variables they're tweaking actually produce consistent outcomes, and then are able to make actual substantial changes on guys who come out of high school maybe with underdeveloped bodies like a DJ Hers or a Tyler Schlaffer. Like those guys have jumped up, their viewers have jumped up, and it's it's systematic change that they can continually apply to guys to obtain results, expected results. And I, I think that's huge for them as an organization. Um, I don't know if they'd agree with me, but that is the kind of inference I've made, especially with all the velo drops I've seen and stuff. It's just, I think this is something where it may take a year or two to actually notice, but I, I'm trying to maybe try to stay ahead of the curve and say, it is this such that in two years, everyone's like, yeah, all these guys are going through velo changes and like they've all been pretty positive and workload management is great. And I wonder why. And it's like, oh yeah, back in 2020, they did this on their high performance staff. So that's kind of my high level takeaway, I'd say. Yeah, it was an opportunity to that 20. I've talked to a few of the guys where that 2020 was a real big opportunity for them to work on things, mm -hmm. whether they're with the outside or not. It just gave them time that they yeah. don't really have. Um, so uh, as we look at your list, now the full list, we can see at marqueesportsnetwork.com. So you can really dive into it there. We're going to kind of dive into some parts of it. And my first question, Tony and I, are, we're, we're the ones, we're going to both do the grilling. So oh, yeah. my first question is when I look at your list and I, I compare it, say, so there's the, uh, like you have the MLB.com list sure. if you want there, whatever, and your list. So when you compare them, there's a lot of similarities. What stuck out mm -hmm. to me about your list by comparison, you are all in on the Cubs outfield. I'm not saying that's wrong or a bad thing, but sure. they're the top four at the uh, top of your list. So you have Davis, P. Crow Armstrong, Kevin Alcantara, and Owen Casey. Just in comparison, if people are wondering, like on the another list, there's Brendan Davis, Christian Hernandez, James Triantos, and Caleb Killian, all guys that you have on your list, just different spots. So I'm just curious. Um, all these players, <laughs> no question, their talent. The reason they rank in that order for you is because... Yeah, I think it, it goes down to an individual basis. I think everybody has Brennan Davis one. Um, sure, I had yes. Brennan Davis one yeah. prior to 2021 when other people kind of were playing with Brandon Marquez at there. And like, I thought it was pretty clear from the individuals I talked to that Davis was one. So that, that's probably an, an understandable rank. PCA being two, for me, heavily relies on the defense. I think a good way to think about how I rank these guys is to look at like a, a probability curve of like where they may end up. And like some of those curves are very, very tall where there isn't too much of a range of possibility but there's a good concentration in the middle of like, we expect this guy to do this, but maybe there's not too much movement off that. Whereas another guy who's really young, they have a massive probability where it's very wide, where there's a chance he just never plays in the major leagues and there's a chance he's a perennial all-star. And with Pico Armstrong, I think he has a very, you know, concentrated probability and it's, and it's to the respect that I think the floor is kind of high despite him being very young because of his defense. I think his defense is one of the most tangibly elite skills in the system. When you watch him, you can tell it is different based on how he moves. I think this goes for anybody, not even a scout. I think I mentioned the blurb I wrote about him where it's like, you know, scouting is very difficult. It's based off of thousands of looks at thousands of players and like the nuances as to why one guy might make it are different than others. And with PCA, I think everyone can notice how good he is as a defender. I think he'll stick in center field. I think he'll be a perennial gold glover. And then for me, it's a matter of figuring out the offense. If he gets the league average OBP, it's a profile that's perennially underrated every year. It may not pop when he goes up on the video board and you see his slash line, but the fact that he's an incredible defender and he, he'll be able to post in that like three, four war window perennially, in my opinion. And I love that they've tinkered with his swing. I think that that's something that, you know, it's going to take some time for him to adjust off. And I know some of the spring looks weren't too great around how exactly he looked at the plate, but I, he's completely changed how he's swinging. And I don't think that's something that immediately clicks for a guy. So I, that's my opinion on him. I, I don't know if there's anyone else in the industry that has him too. I think there might be some other niche sites that do, but some of the main ones, they, they do have them a little bit lower maybe because they're kind of pushing down the offensive profile. Whereas I kind of see it as more of like, just get the league average OPP and be a good defender. And I think he's number sure. two in the system. 
Alcantara has a ton of upside, super lanky guy. There's not a lot of comps around him. I, I think I kind of like like a Jose Martinez -y comp because of the size and some of the mannerisms and his swing. But the batted ball profile is much better than Jose Martinez's. Like I, I think there's a ton of projectability there and the power as well as the contact side of things. And I think that goes for Owen Casey as well, where he's another guy where uh, even, uh, despite his age, he's hit at every level. We saw him, I think, get a couple extra base hits in spring training. Um, the eggs velocities on him are really good. Uh, he's an odd combination where he doesn't chase out of the zone too much, doesn't swing and miss a lot. He has a ton of power, yet the contact rate's kind of low. So I think that's kind of lowish hanging fruit where if they're able to figure out what's wrong with that, some of the contact in the zone and that comes up and it, and it comes as a product of not having to swing and chase and really change his approach much. The, the sky's the limit there where I think that he's a pretty sure bet to be like a 260, 30-ish homer guy. Um, and maybe that's more of like a tail outcome, something that's maybe not totally likely, especially given his age. But I see that as a real possibility, um, whereas maybe I don't see that too much with some of the other guys. But I will say like as a whole, one through nine on this, maybe with the exception of Brent Davis being a little bit higher, let's say like two through nine is kind of one tier. So the differences between say two and three, three and four, four and five aren't as big as say between nine and 10, where I see a bit of a tier drop off. So it's not like you're going down steps, so to speak, on this list. It's a little bit more like it's, it's staggered in terms of where these guys are placed. So I don't see too much of like a future value difference between PCA, Alcantara, and Casey, especially given their age. I just really like those guys. I, I just I guess I landed on them from that perspective and just enjoying their profiles more. Yeah, you know, I, I'm definitely looking forward to, to seeing PCA play the outfield more. I, I got just a little – taste of it in, in spring when he was out there, he made that really nice catch. Um, he almost made, you know, a, a, had a home run robbery that I know Scott Shagnon was right there for photos on. Um, but, you know, just being a former outfielder myself, like I love guys who can just go get it, the Kevin Kiermaier, Byron Buxton's and stuff like that. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. But Lance, I know you were talking just a little bit about tears and when you and I were talking about this list. So in the past, the, the previous two iterations of this list, you did top 20. Yeah. Now you're doing top 25. And I know the reason for you was, was just, you felt like there were a lot of guys maybe between like 15, 25 range that it was hard to, to really separate them and get down to 20. Can you just explain a little bit about, you know, why, why the change from, from 20 to yeah. 25 in terms of top lists and just where that whole maybe kind of group is bunched together? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that adding the extra five just even if I'm saying that the steps are not the same, like someone reading the list might think they're the same such that when you get to 20, you're like, wow, there's like five guys, six guys that I know about as a Cubs fan, you know, like, like a Braylon Marquez who I have a 21 or a Palencia who's in the, uh, in a trade. Um, and I forgot who for at this moment, which is not Chafin. There we go. It's Chafin from the A's. I knew it was the A's. I forgot who they traded, but, and even like a Pinango or like some of the, um, some of the high leverage relievers, I always like leaving that last spot for like any reliever you think could be leverage. Like, I think people know who these guys are such that if you go to 20 and cut it off there, I think there's would be a lot of – I feel like I'm almost protecting myself to zone. <laughs> where people would be like, how is he on the list? How is he on the list? So we add five more. So you just extend the depth. Depth. Yeah, exactly. Like, right? I like it. Smart. Like you, Lance. <laughs> sneaky, sneaky. But no, I, I really do think it's a testament to the depth in the system. It's just there's a lot of guys between, let's say, like 15 to 30-ish. Like I had – I emailed you guys before this, the guys who just missed, and I, I wrote four names down, and then I was like – I think there's probably more. And I went back and I saw, and I was like, oh, there's like four more guys here that I like was thinking about in that 20 to 25 window. So even now there's still more of a drop off, but again, this is a testament. The depth in player development is a testament to what the Cubs are doing in terms of the overhauls they've made with Breslow coming in the high performance stuff I talked about, which I, I don't know if I'm going to jump out to 30 next year. I'll keep it at 25, <laughs> but like we may have to do more. <laughs> yeah. The just miss list might be a little long, but that might extend every year. There we go. Uh, well, it's interesting that you bring that up because one of the guys who uh, I was looking at, who we got to look at in spring training, who proved to be very athletic was Chase Strong. And that's mm. just one of the guys. I know you said there's a few. And and so kind of I'll, I'll kind of clump that comment into my question, which is uh, you had even mentioned, especially that two through nine, two through 10 or two through nine, you'd said nine, kind of yeah. just kind of um, like the next tier. With that said, how difficult then was it to do like the rankings and to figure all this out, especially since you uh, have been very, you've been able to see these guys, yeah. uh, be, talk to them a lot, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely try not to bias myself by too much of what I see. Cause like, I know I'm not as trained as a scout. And I think that that's like something you realize over time. It's just like those scouts see so much. 
that I value their input a lot. And again, getting a peek behind the curtain with some of the data, it does help me kind of like get a different perspective on guys where if maybe I saw him in a really small sample and wasn't impressed, you know, if he has a much larger sample of really good performance from the prior year, I'm able to see that in the data. I think that's the most valuable thing. This happened with a guy like Pinyango for me where, and even Christian uh, Franklin actually is another one where, you know, comes out of D1, uh, really advanced bat, but I just didn't see him great when I was in Myrtle Beach. Like, I just didn't think he played particularly well. And that's not a knock on him at all. I think he was just acclimating to being, jumping around through the College World Series and, you know, coming to Pro Bowl. Like, there's transition periods for guys such that when I see him for three games and he goes, you know, over whatever with a couple walks, I'm like, okay, I just didn't see any bad balls. So how am I supposed to make an assessment on this guy? So I like going back to the data in that perspective of like, okay, now it's the end of the year. There's a much larger sample than I saw. Where is this guy looking in terms of how hard he's hitting the ball, et cetera? So I, I, for me, that's kind of how I'd say I approach it. Um, and again, like a Strump, Strump's a good player. Like I, I think that there's some kind of major league role there for him because it's, a, it's an interesting combination of good third base defense along with a decent bat. And I don't think he whiffs a ton either, which is – Maybe something that can drive up the OBP and push him into a role. There's just there's a lot of guys like him, I think, where there's an advanced college bat and maybe there's the ceiling isn't crazy high, such that I tend to maybe lean towards like a Pinago where I think the ceiling might be a little higher. Drew Gray, I love on the pitching side, even though he just went down with TJ, a uh, Tommy John surgery and such. So so it's tough. Like, yeah, I guess I guess you could almost say like Strump could have been in Christian Franklin's spot. I just like what I saw in terms of Franklin's data a little more, I think. Um, that's kind of my answer, I'd say. Okay. Lance, as you, I know you're always like thinking about this and, you know, you and I talked just a bunch just about the rankings over the last calendar yeah. year plus, but as you were sitting down to do this, as you were, you know, putting pen to paper or whatever, typing it out, like one through 25, were you surprised? Were you surprised? Like, Hey, I, you know, I, I did, wasn't expecting to have um, Jordan Wicks five or whatever it is. Like what surprised you as you were going through the rankings and just, you know, maybe from a preconceived notion to putting it all together and putting it in a list form that stood out to you. Yeah, I think for me, it was going through like the 10 through 25, writing them up and like putting sh more aggressive language in some of the projection. Like that, that's where I think maybe a lot of the value comes from, where it's like you're looking through an exit of Vizcaino and like I see him as like a secondaries based guy. So I, I don't think particularly his fastball is great, which is again, not a knock on him. It's just his other secondaries are really good. Good change, good slider. I think they're going to tinker with some of his breaking balls in terms of how their shapes look right now. Like he, I was thinking like, okay, if they do anything to his fastball to correct it, like then you have a guy who's plus fastball with great secondaries. It's just like, can I assume that the fastball is going to get substantially better? Or if I think that there's some possibility of that, how much do I bake into the rank? And that happened with a ton of guys in the back half of this. Like Daniel Palencia averages like 97, 98 on his fastball. He's a guy who's curveball based. But I think again, like the modern game is showing us that curveballs aren't as effective as secondaries. Whereas that's a great third pitch, fourth pitch, but I don't see, you don't see many guys coming up through the minor leagues, unless they're really, really good curveballs, um, those sticking such that, you know, I think he's going to go to a slider eventually, but do I assume that in his rank? And like, do I assume the shape looks really good? And that again, pushes his profile forward. So like some of the language around like, Hey, if this tweak happens, this guy could shoot up and be a top 10 next year. I think I felt myself saying that on a lot of guys late. Um, and I don't really remember saying that maybe when I was ranking prior to 20, 21 per se. Uh, maybe that was because I didn't have too much of the data. Maybe that's because I didn't know the system as well. I'm trying not to fall in love with too many of these guys as you see them more and also interact with them too. I enjoy talk. I've talked to, I think a good amount of the guys on this list too, and dug into like what they're doing and why they're doing it and try to get that rationale. Um, so I, that's the main thing for me is just like writing up the 20th overall guy and being like, wow, I just put that he could be top eight in the next year if he does X and Y. It's like, I don't know how many lists you can do that on. You know, like I, I, the 20th guy usually on lists, you start to kind of forget. But like for me, that's Christian Franklin. And like his approach is fantastic. Average exit velo for him is right around already around major league average. It's kind of like approach refinement with him where it's like, OK, if he's rough, stumbles into a little more power, like there's probably a chance he's an everyday regular. But do I assume that he's stumbling into more power or do I assume it's the current approach going forward? Because he's a little bit older and a little more advanced of a bat where I don't know if you see too much drastic change at that point. So it's tough. Like the rankings are tough, but I think I was really bullish on some of the guys late. So that actually leads into my last question uh, perfectly. And I think Tony will have one more for you too. So my last question, I'm curious, you were mentioning like in, in with specific players, how this list could change, like leaps, jumps guys mm. could make. 
at this point, when you're going to continue evaluating these players over the course of a season, do you simply just look at now results, how these guys are panning out or what would, what are you looking at? That's going to uh, change a list. And even at some points, maybe pretty drastically, if a guy makes a big jump. Yeah, I think it's a combination of results. And, and again, jumping back to some of the data outputs that I can get that that show me if there's a tangible change that I like better that makes this a pitch objectively better. You know what I mean? Is the slider moving more at a higher velocity? Does the fastball movement look better? Is it getting a little bit more carry? Is he doing something differently in terms of how he's able to get certain movement from his release, which is the thing that's becoming a lot more popular now? So that's kind of what I'd say. It's, it's a bit of a combination of a couple of things, but yeah, it's, it's looking for those little things. It's almost probably looking, going back through the list, reading through what I wrote, and then looking mid-year and going, okay, is there something that lines up with what I thought here? Like with the Vizcaino example, it's like, okay, is the fastball better? Is it using it more? Is it more effective pitch? Can I look at that and figure that out? And if that's true, then that fulfills what I, exactly what I was looking for preseason, and he'll probably come up on the rank. And if not, then it's a matter of like, okay, do I think that probability is still there? Do I think the probability dipped? Or maybe something else changed. Maybe the role changed. Maybe – the mix completely changed. Like we've seen this with a lot of guys, like Jordan Wicks is a great example, really good interview we did with him, Scotty Shada and uh, a couple other people. We, we talked through him, uh, his mix in terms of what he changed. And like yeah. a, a projections are funny because like you can project whatever you want on Jordan Wicks, but the reality is like, he's not using a sinker this year, he completely changed the slider and his curveball is an actual curveball. So like how much stock do you put in what he did at Kansas state now that three pitches are different? You know, I, I really struggle with that sometimes, especially with major league projections too, when guys change mix. It's like, how much are projections accurate? Like, I get that there's obviously error in all projections. Maybe some people take them too much as like the end all be all. But yeah, with Wix, it's a great example. It's like, okay, everything's different here. So like, I don't really know what to make of last year. I don't know what to make of K-State. Like, let's see what his new mix looks like. Give me two months of, of reps down at South Bend. If the Cubs like what they see, they probably will push him up to double A, I imagine at some point, maybe it's mid-year, maybe it's a little later. And at that point, we'll have a much better idea of what he's going to look like potentially as a major leaguer than we did prior to this season. Lance, so one specific guy I wanted to ask you about was uh, James Triantos. I was, you know, just had the opportunity yeah. to look at him and, and watch him play in spring and was really impressed. I, I mean, I know it's obviously a very small sample size, but, you know, three hits in his first three big league appearances in spring, including, you know, this infield single off of Bumgarner. But, you know, for a guy who just turned 19, you know, has this like, it, talk about numbers. I mean, when he, after he was drafted in the second round last year, he went up and put up, put up numbers right away in pro ball. Um, you know, just in general, like, where do you see him? You have him at number seven, but you know, is there a ceiling of like potentially number one, assuming obviously Brennan Davis graduates this year. And just in general, where do you see Triantos uh, development path, maybe and trajectory going? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a clear trend up on him. Um, I, it's a profile that's very heavily based off the hit tool. And maybe there's not too much understanding as to where he plays defensively. Um, it's kind of like second base could probably play a little short right now, but I think the system's way too stacked on the shortstop side for him to break in there. I like him as a second baseman. Personally. I think that if you look at how a lot of championship rosters are constructed, it's, it's a big bat at second base, which is I think a deviation from the past. You look at like Ozzy Albies, incredible bat, really good defender. Chris Taylor is a really underrated player out in Los Angeles. Really, really good bat on his end. Altuve again, like these guys, like that is the championship team is built with a strong, strong second baseman. And for him, I think he slots in really well there where it's really, really hits to where there's a big deviation between how hard he hits the ball on average and the max exit velocity he has. Max exit velocity is something you're going to hear on like Shohei Otani and Stan and Judge all the time. Average exit velocity maybe isn't talked about as much, but is probably as predictive, if not more predictive. Uh, for his age, when you age adjusted for him, he hits the ball really hard, a ton. And I love that. But there is a little bit of a gap on the max exit velocity side. So for me, I'm looking at him and going, okay, over the next couple of years, what do the Cubs want to do with his swing, right? Do you want to sacrifice some of the hits and try to get him into a little more power? Or are you comfortable with him stumbling into like 15-ish home runs, but like a ton of doubles batting 280 with a decent OBP because the approach is so good and just giving him pitchers fits because his hit tool is so good. I know some other sites are giving him like a 70 grade hit tool. So in the scouting world, that means it's like two standard deviations above the mean, which is essentially saying that there's a potential for him to be like a top one or two percenter on that pure hit tool side of things. So that's just bat the ball. Um, and a couple other components around the hit tool side too, which are a little complex depending on who you're talking to in terms of the scout. But yeah, he's got a lot of ceiling. I, I think that he already doubled in Myrtle beach. I thought I saw a video of that the other day. Um, I like him. I, I like him probably as a candidate to jump into the outfielder tier here pretty quickly um, over like a Jordan Wicks, who I think has a higher floor, maybe not too much of a ceiling, so to speak. 
Hernandez is another one too that this is going to be his first time in Arizona Complex League on the United States soil against pitching that still probably isn't as good. So I don't know if I'm going to just off my rank on him too much, regardless of how he plays, because I kind of want to see it against better pitching. But Toronto's already getting exposed at his age with really good exit velo. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes into Merle and hits like 280. And then I'd love to see him up at Southland at the end of the year. That'd be great. And if, if the Cubs agree and do that, then I think he's a guy who probably ends up easily top five. Um, to push off PCA at two for him or potentially go to one, say, say Davis graduates and you just move everybody else up on my list. It's something when you'd really have to see PCA struggle on the offensive side, which I don't think I see happening for the entirety of the year. Um, so maybe I'd say highest probability, Brennan graduates, PCA is one, and I'll go Toronto's two or three. Um, and it'll be a tough time to see between Alcantara, Casey, PCA, and, and, and uh, Toronto's who I like there. Like that's going to be a tough, that's going to rely heavily on like, has anything drastically changed in 2022? You know, what's standing out? What are the results, et cetera, et cetera. But Toronto's is great. I think he's got a ton of helium. Uh, it's Lance spends a ton of time on this stuff. You do a great job. Thank you. With it. And so I think I was looking at your list. I think in our conversation, we were able to kind of, uh, really talk about at least the first seven of the prospects mm-hmm. you have ranked, but the whole list again is on marquee So you can check it out there. You have full descriptions. You've really, uh, just gone in really in depth with everything and it's, it's impressive work, Lance. So we appreciate it. And we appreciate you coming on to talk about it. Um, cause obviously, uh, you just, yeah, have, have a, a good sense of what is going on through the system. So it's always fun to talk to you about Thank it too, you. for that reason. Uh, I think on that note, that's going to wrap things up guys. So that was a, a fun talk today. So that'll do it for this edition of the Cubs weekly podcast presented by Wintrust. Don't forget to download and subscribe to the pod on Spotify or Apple podcasts and check us out in video form on the marquee sports network app and YouTube. For Tony Andraki, Lance Brozdowski, I'm Elise Meneker. As always, thank you for watching.